Hello, I'm Dr. Mewborn, and this is History of the Baptist. It is so good to be with you today. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into our study as we got a lot to cover today. Um, I want to show you this picture real quick of pilgrims in New England. I think this is a great picture. They're there um, by the uh, by the ocean, I guess you would say, and um, and they're praying. And this is kind of a, a way of looking at these are people that were trying to leave the oppression and the persecution for the most part of what was going on in the Church of England. And so they were moving away. These would be people that are called separatists. They're separating from the Church of England because they don't believe in religious oppression. They want to be, they believe in religious freedom and freedom uh, uh, in such a way that you can worship how that you how you want to worship. And so that's kind of what this picture represents. But it's one of those things for us or opportunities for us to kind of see here they are. These people are pioneers coming over on a long voyage on a boat and trying to come to a free land so that they can worship freely. It's kind of neat when you look at it. I showed you this slide before, but why did they come to America? Pilgrims sought to purify their church. Separatists given up hope of reformation within the Anglican church, wanted to separate from it and start their own churches. Puritans, however, sought to purify their church, not separatists, wanted to perform, to reform their church from within. Ch uh, church of England continued to be the official church. Uh, so we talked about that a little bit in the past, but I want to kind of get help you understand as we move forward, because what we're looking at today is the rise of the general and particular Baptists. Now, who were the first Baptists? One of the things we looked at were these two types of people, General Baptists and Particular Baptists. General Baptists believe in general atonement, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all. Uh, but then Particular Baptists believe that he died for a select particular group. Um, then further into that, uh, that was influenced, the General Baptist influenced by Jacob Arminius, greater focus on free will. Some believe that a person could fall from grace. Particular Baptist, influenced more by John Calvin, greater focus on predestination and perseverance of the saints. You kind of see it continue on. What we're going to talk more about today is John Smith, Thomas Helwes were leaders of the earliest Baptist churches. At least 47 of these churches were started in England in 1650. Particular Baptist, Henry, Jesse, William Kiffin, John Spilsbury led the charge for the particular Baptist. At least seven of these types of churches were functional by 1644. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about these people that we are talking about. This is John Smith right here, 1570 to 1612 educated in Cambridge, England, ordained as an Anglican priest with the Church of England, broke from the Church of England, and moved to Holland. Um, of course, he didn't agree with what was happening in the Church of England, and so he pushed away from it, pulled away from it, and ended up in 1609, along with a small group of people, believers in Holland, came to believe in believers' baptism. And so this was a change in him. And so what did that look like? Well, 1608, congregation moved to Amsterdam, lived in a bakery owned by Mennonites. Now, this is very interesting. The Mennonites uh, come from a person where they get the name Minno Simons is their leader, and we'll start with that. And he was an Anabaptist person who believed that um, infant baptism was not the right way, not, not the right method of baptism, uh, and not the right mode of baptism. Instead, it should be an adult believer's baptism. And this is what Menno Simons believed. He, he was an Anabaptist. And so um, when John Smith went to um, Holland, what he did was he joined up with a lot of these people known as Mennonites and um, in that area of Anabaptist. And that's how he got caught up in that. In 1609, um, there was a reformation for them under the New Testament based on the model of believer's baptism. So when they read the scripture, when he read the scripture and his group of people read the scripture, or his congregation, they said, man, well, this is this new model. What does it talk about? Well, it talks about believer's baptism. Separatists, which he was, uh, had felt uneasy about valid validity of baptism in apostate Church of England. So they felt like if you were baptized in the Church of England, you were completely wrong in what you were doing. That church was not right, um, and that was um, that was just. Uh, an ungodly way of doing it. Uh, the Bible study that they were doing led to uh, to desire to follow the New Testament model and model of baptism and things like that. 
No record of infant baptism in the New Testament was one of the things that they found, and that was a really big deal for them. Um, and possible influence came to them through the Mennonites in Amsterdam, and uh, of course, a lot of Anabaptists there as well. 1609, um, John Smith adopts believer's baptism, baptizes himself, then Helwes, and about 40 others. And this becomes a very interesting thing that he baptized himself. It actually causes some struggles later on. But baptized by fusion, which they poured water over their cells. So they didn't even follow the full-on immersion uh, way of doing baptism. They poured water on top of themselves. So first, John Smith baptized himself through by fusion, and then he baptized the others. And that later changed to immersion. Um, a few weeks later, he doubted the validity of the baptism and wanted to join Waterlander Mennonites and wrote a short confession uh, about this type of thing. And so um, I want us to, uh, we're going to talk more about that as we go. Um, he seeks admission into the Mennonite Fellowship was just a weird thing because he was, he was really branching off of the Church of England, becoming an Anna, Anabaptist, and then he seeks to be with the Mennonites. It becomes a huge issue, and eventually he dies without any affiliation. Just a, uh, just a little while later, dies without any affiliation, no membership with any congregation, and he was considered to be the first person, um, first Baptist church in modern time. And it's just a, kind of a sad thing of what all happened during toward the end of his life there. And so uh, there's so much to say about John Smith and his story. But as we kind of are running through Baptist history, this is what we see. Thomas Hel Helwes, um, he was from a wealthy family. Helwes financed his trip to Amsterdam. He left his wife and children in England at the time to go and be a part of this ministry with John Smith. Helwes disagreed with Smith's decision to become a Mennonite and became a pastor of a few who remained. Now that's an interesting point too because he is going to kind of take over a group of people. He's going to come back to England and he's going to start a church, a, a Baptistic type church in England. 1611, he wrote a declaration of faith of the English people, which is really important. We're going to look at that, some of that in just a second. First Baptist Confession of Faith in English. Um, and so we're going to uh, go ahead and, and see that in just a moment. Smith and Helwe split uh, disagreement over self-baptism. Helwe did not think that you could baptize yourself. You had to be baptized um, by somebody else, and that just became a big issue. Suspicion over Mennonite Christology. I try to do some study on this. I think this is interesting. Um, Mennonite Christology is based on, uh, of course, uh, Minnow Simons and, and the Mennonites believe that the uh, the nature of Christ is ultimately, yes, he is God, yes, he is man, or he has man, um, he is a man. But however, his flesh was given him by God. It's like a celestial body was given him. So it's not a body that comes from Adam. It's not a body that comes from Mary, but instead it's a body that comes from heaven. And so I thought that was very interesting. And this is why there was some, there was a huge issue between Smith and Helwes. And that's why Helwes had such an issue with Smith's um, changing over, trying to become Mennonite. Uncomfortable with Smith's theological changes that he was going through. And we talked about some of those. Original sin, justification, uh, this whole thing we're dealing with, um, who is in charge and all that type of stuff. There's a lot of a lot dealing with that. Helwes returned to England in 1611, which that's an interesting time. That's the same time that the King James Version of the Bible was uh, coming out, the first uh, King James. Established the first English Baptist church near London, um, spearheaded the general baptist movement and this is and this is where helwes is kind of splitting off and doing his own thing he penned a short declaration of the mystery of iniquity in uh in 1612 and so there's some changes here some splits that were going on and it was had a lot to do with um with what uh smith and helwes believe theologically and of course some of the practices going on in their lives all right let's talk about this declaration of faith that Helwes had, believers' baptism and close communion only for members, free will aided by God's grace, Article 4, general atonement. There also, there's an opportunity there, falling from grace. So the atonement, Jesus Christ on the cross for all. 
Um, General Baptists take their name from their doctrine that Jesus died generally for all people. And uh, as we continue on through this, church established by the confession of faith and baptism, uh, not covenant form of theology. All right, church is autonomous, yet connected to the whole. So universal in a sense, uh, but autonomous in, in local uh, settings. Church members can do ordinances without pastors. And that's what was put into Article uh, 11 there uh, by Helwes. And church is, churches should not get too big. They felt like if, um, if the ministries there, if what's going on gets too big, you're not going to be able to really fulfill the needs of the people and you're not going to be good at shepherding those people. It goes on to say congregational rule and authority extends only to the congregation, officers, elders, and deacons, both men and women. I think that was interesting. Participa participation of government and oaths not forgiven not forbidden uh in article 24 and 25 so that's kind of what you see with this declaration of faith by helwes basic characteristics of english separatism um what do we see that's that's really kind of these basic characteristics the primacy of the bible insistence on a regenerate church rejection of higher hierarchical um church authority some congregational some presbyterian simple and spontaneous style of worship um, and these are some of the things that you see with this English separatism. And I just wanted to put this verse up here. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Um, that's given to us in Isaiah. A very strong passage that's referring to what some of these separatists believe. Now, if you think about it, uh, these English separatists were saying there's a huge problem that's going on in England with the Church of England. And they were breaking off of that starting the general and particular Baptist churches. And eventually what we see is happening in New England with the separatists that are going there. So they, they were standing firm in what they believed. Um, the theology of the general Baptist, they believe in general atonement, focus on free will. God was by no means responsible for um, the damnation of sinners. Uh, also, all who heard the gospel had the opportunity to be saved. So that's a lot of the theology that you see with the General Baptist. Now, talking about particular Baptists, the, fir the first particular Baptist church also emerged out of the English separatism. And um, you might have heard this before, but in 1616, we we'll call it the JLJ Church. And simply what that is, it's named after three pastors, Henry Jacob, uh, John Lathrop, and Henry Jesse, that's a JLJ, just last names there, semi-separatist congregation that began to experience controversy concerning baptism. So they really started to see some issues as well. In 1630, a guy by the name of Mr. Dupper left because a member had his child baptized in the state church. And so you're starting to see people that, um, that were particular Baptist that believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for a particular group, these people said, hey, I, I'm, I'm noticing these things, so we're pulling out and we're going to do our own thing. 1633, Samuel Eaton received a further baptism along with others and left to start a new church as well because he saw that there wasn't, um, there wasn't any teaching of infant baptism, and he was saying, I'm going to go for a further baptism. Instead of be called, being called necessarily an Anabaptist, um, he said further Baptist is what they were called. It's kind of interesting. Um, and so you see this as a particular Baptist, their confession, the first London Confession of Faith, 1646, which we'll see some part, portions of that as we go. The JLJ Church. In 1638, a group of six left and joined with Eaton, agreeing with him about baptism, joining with Mr. Spilsbury, who was also a pastor. And what we see is this is this this group is is leaving um, uh, and and joining with um, other pastors that believed in particular the particular Baptist beliefs. 1640, 41, Richard Blunt, member of Spilsbury Congregation, received baptism by immersion from Dutch Anabaptists. And so we see that kind of happening. Um, and then 1633 through 1640, first particular Baptist, this is when the people began to solidify their beliefs. They started to pull that together saying, this is our confession. This is what our thoughts are. This is our creed. This is our faith. This is what we're going by. 1645, Jesse becomes Baptist and rest of the uh, JLJ Church. 
All right, so that's kind of what we see going on in the start of everything. So let's look real quick at the first London Confession. 1644, seven particular Baptist congregations issued a confession of faith. That's what we're talking about. Four of these congregations came out of the JLJ Church, right? And then refuted accusations that particular Baptists were radical Anabaptists like those of Munster. And these radical Anabaptists believed that Reformation would improve theology, number one, as well as social and political relationships. And so they didn't agree with that. Um, they were saying that's not really the case here. Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross to change the political uh, landscape. He didn't die on the cross to change just the social landscape. He died on the cross to save souls, and so that's where they're going with all this. So they're, they're refuting a lot of these comments that are being made uh, about them, all right? Um, continue on with the confession. Uh, what's talked about in the confession is particular atonement, perseverance of the saints, human depravity implied, not pronounced like Dort, but it's definitely implied. Faith is a gift of God. Um, omitted teaching on reprobation, which, of course, that was taught by John Calvin and, and many others, uh, Beza as well. Gospel to be preached to all, uh, but only a particular group would be saved. Uh, no mention of covenant theology, so they didn't go into that. But they, And they did have a strong Christology, which which was the nature of Christ. He was 100% God, 100% man, and they were focusing in strongly on that. Church composed of visible saints, people that you knew uh, were Christians. It's not just people could be out there and be Christians. There had to be fruit uh, to their lives. Baptism by immersion, um, that's what they believe. First official statement of believers, baptism by immersion. Congregational polity, uh, was oh, the way that they um, governed the church. Fourfold ministry, as in Calvinism. Pastor, teacher, elder, deacon was their uh, polity there. And then de establishment of the state church was also going on with the particular Baptist. So they were breaking away from the state church as well. Uh, what you see with particular and general Baptist, it comes down to the great debate. And what is the great debate? Calvinism and Arminianism, still a hot topic today. Um, you might have seen this before. It's called the tulip. And, uh, and the tulip in Calvinism is called total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. And so um, what you see in Arminianism is, is a form of total depravity, maybe a little bit different, but it's also total depravity, prevenient grace. Atonement for all, resistible grace, security in Christ. Um, you know, sometimes we look at these terms and we're like, this is just semantics. But really, when you start breaking these down, they're very, very different based on the, um, the foundation by which you believe. When you see this, you can kind of understand where these guys were coming from in their belief systems. Well, it's good to be with you today. Um, that's the end of our, our time, and so uh, it is good to be with you. Hope you have a, a blessed day, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.